You know, as, as we work our way through this series of messages, nine reasons that you should know Jesus, I hope you'll uh, delve into uh, not just the sermon and the sermon notes that you take home each Sunday, but uh, uh, as we, I don't think I mentioned this last Sunday, but all of these series are coming from the Gospel of Luke. And uh, I would really encourage you through these uh, weeks, uh, nine weeks, to read in the Gospel of Luke. Maybe read it through several times and uh, meditate on what it means to really know Jesus. And isn't it a great thing uh, that uh, most everybody in this room today knows Jesus? Would you agree that's great? Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. It's mediocre. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I hear an Amen. 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 Okay. And, uh, and I'm thankful that we as a congregation know Jesus and that we, uh, because we want other people to know Jesus, that we have a, a mission outreach and uh, uh, that for a number of years, uh, quite a large percentage of our offerings go every week uh, to missions. And uh, some of you will remember that back uh, over 20 years ago, when A.J. Law graduated from Roanoke Bible College and he and Indu headed back to their native India uh, to work for the Lord, that uh, I had the privilege of serving as his uh, forwarding agent for a couple of years. And God has so, God blessed back then that mission so, so rapidly that it wasn't long, it was a couple of years, and I decided I was either going to have to be the minister at Avalon or the full-time forwarding agent for, for A.J. Well, it's obvious which choice I made. Uh, but uh, I, I say all of that to introduce some special guests today. Uh, the mission of A.J. and Indu Law has just grown rapidly through the years. There are over 500 congregations in India, out in the villages and towns of India, through the work of Central India Christian Mission. And uh, now churches all across the United States support the work of Central India Christian Mission. And so it is a major work. And uh, we have a couple with us today who are shouldering a lot of that work, taking care of the, the funds and uh, the paperwork and uh, publicity and a lot of those things. And uh, Susan and L.V. Spencer, would y'all just stand where you are? Let's give them an Avalon welcome. The Central India Christian Mission board meeting is, starts tomorrow morning at, uh, up in Northern Virginia at the Calvary Church in Burke, Virginia, and Susan and L.V. are from Houston, Texas, uh, so they detoured just a little bit uh, on their way up to Northern Virginia, and we're certainly happy to have y'all worshiping with us today, Susan and L.V., and appreciate so much all of the work that you do for the kingdom and for CICM in, in particular. Uh, today we want to continue in that series of messages. Remember last week we talked about reason number one, you should know Jesus, is because of his flawless character. And today we want to talk about his unshakable confidence. We should know Jesus because of his unshakable confidence. And as we work our way through today's message and you fill in the blanks on your outline, uh, here's my hope and prayer that is, that as we see the confidence that was manifested in Jesus' life and character, that you and I as followers of Christ would imitate him and have that same kind of confidence as we seek to be light and salt in a world of darkness today. Uh, and again, it's coming from Luke, Luke chapter 4. If you want to open your Bibles, if you're using one of the pew Bibles there, I think it's page 727, we'll take you right to Luke chapter 4. Uh, for, now, for you sports fans, you'll appreciate this story. Uh, a few years ago, the uh, Boston Celtics basketball team was in a game, and in a last-second huddle, the game was close. In fact, the game was on the line, and uh, Coach Casey Jones at that time was diagramming a play that he wanted carried out when they went back out on the court. But the Celtics star for forward, Larry Bird, you'll remember that name, uh, protested right in the middle of the play being diagrammed. He said, just get the ball to me and everyone get out of the way. Well, Coach Jones looked up at Larry Bird and said, Larry, I'm the coach here. I'll call the play. And then he turned around to the other players and he said, now, here's what we're going to do. Get the ball to Larry and get out of the way. <laughs> You know, successful people always have confidence in their ability to succeed. And that confidence is contagious. 
Insecure, apprehensive people, on the other hand, don't inspire anyone. But a leader is someone who knows where he or she is going and is able to persuade others to follow. Winston Churchill rallied Great Britain at the beginning of World War II by instilling confidence in victory against what seemed to be insurmountable odds. Uh, You've perhaps read the uh, segment of his speech that he made at the beginning of the war, but every time I read this, it just gets my blood pumping. But here's what Winston Churchill said. He said to to his nation, We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall never surrender. And, of course, we know that they didn't surrender. All of England began to believe that they could win because of the confidence of their leader. A good leader inspires people with confidence in himself. A great leader instills confidence in people with confidence in themselves. And we could add a godly leader inspires people with confidence in God. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. And that's what we, want to do, what we want to do today. Let's look at the confidence of Jesus and seek to emulate His example. Because you see, our confidence is not self-confidence, but confidence in Christ. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Our confidence is not to be a haughty arrogance or pride, but a humble assurance that the promises of God that we find in His Word are true. For example, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. What's Paul saying? He's saying we are confident of heaven when life here on earth comes to an end. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What's he saying? He said, as Christians, we pray with confidence. We approach God's throne with our petitions, knowing that he is able and most of the time willing uh, to do whatever it is that we request of him. Hebrews 13.6 says, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? What's he saying? We are confident of God's protection in our lives. And so that assurance that God's promises are true makes life more peaceful and more uh, full of joy. And so looking at Luke chapter 4, if you haven't already turned there to Luke chapter 4, let's look at the unshakable confidence of Jesus as he goes back to his hometown. Now, we should know Jesus because he had this majestic confidence, and we'll see it illustrated in four ways here in Luke chapter 4. So let's begin. Number one, Jesus had confidence to preach in his hometown. Jesus had confidence to preach in his hometown. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking, so? Maybe you've never heard the stories the horror stories of preachers going back to preach in their hometowns. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Look at the text in Luke 4:14. 4, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues. Everyone praised him. Here's the key. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. So Jesus goes back to his hometown, of Nazareth, and he preaches in Nazareth. And again, as I indicated, that's not easy for most preachers to do. Now, when I go back to preach at Oak Grove, that little rural congregation near Chatham, Virginia, where I grew up, uh, usually sitting in the audience are people that grew up with me. There may be some former school teachers. There are definitely some former Sunday school teachers, classmates, family members. Now, I realize that There are a lot of people here in Tidewater who come to Avalon to seek my mature wisdom, but (laughs) that wasn't supposed to be funny. (laughs) But in Chatham, Virginia, they say, isn't this the guy who fainted in front of his class in the sixth grade? They say, isn't this the young fellow who wore knickers to Sunday school long after they'd gone out of style? 
Isn't this the same guy who the first time he tried to preach to us here at Oak Grove ended up stretched out under the oak trees before he finished his sermon because he fainted halfway through? You see, that's what happens when some preachers go back to their hometown. Well, Jesus went back to his hometown. And his former babysitter, school teachers, rabbis, classmates were there. Probably some people who bought some tables and chairs from the carpenter's shop. But now he's coming back as a preacher and a teacher. Now, nobody could attack his character or question his integrity because we saw last Sunday, you remember, his flawless character he had never seen. But they did challenge his celebrity status. Some said, isn't that Joseph, the carpenter's son? And probably some said, didn't he grow up here, out, maybe out on the edge of town? But look at verse 22. The Bible seems to indicate that at first, at least, at first, they were intrigued by Jesus. It says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. In fact, probably they were becoming proud of this hometown boy from Nazareth, which was kind of a lowly town, the scriptures indicate, but which was becoming well known throughout the countryside because of Jesus and his ministry. But like most of us today, they were also quick to criticize and remind other people he's really no bigger than the rest of us. You see, Jesus was rapidly becoming a celebrity, but he went back home. And here's the phrase I like. He went into the synagogue as was his custom. He went into the synagogue as was his custom. You see, when he was a little boy, every Sabbath day, his parents would take him to the synagogue. When he became a teenager, every Sabbath, he went into the synagogue with his parents. When he became a carpenter, a young single man in, in Nazareth, he didn't drift away as so many times young people do today. But he continued every Sabbath to go to the synagogue as was his custom. Now, after being gone for a while, he com comes back and as was his custom, he goes back to the synagogue where he was very familiar you can just almost picture the scene as he's making his way into the synagogue, seeing some people that he hadn't seen for a long time. Hello, Jesus. It's good to see you again. Good to see you too. How's your family? As they were in, making uh, exchanges of greetings. And they ask him, would you read scripture? Would you speak for us today? And he confidently gets up to preach. You know, there's a lesson here. I've sort of dwelt on the idea of closeness of relationships. You know, sometimes the most difficult people to talk to about God are the people who knew you well when you were younger. Isn't that true? Many of us have found that out, trying to talk to an old school uh, schoolmate or maybe even trying to talk to a relative with whom we grew up who doesn't know Jesus yet. And why is that? Maybe it's because we, we feel they're aware of my sins, they're skeptical, or you know that they're aware of your sins and you feel somewhat hypocritical. Or maybe it's because they remember you as a child and they sort of freeze frame you, you know, right there as a child. And, and they have a hard time picturing you as having anything worthwhile to say to them here in adulthood. Uh, picturing you as being mature to have anything worthwhile to share. I, I don't know why it is, but sometimes it's easier to go to to Florida and witness to a stranger on the beach than to go back to your hometown or to people who are close to you and talk to them about the Lord. But could I just pause right here to inject that the good news that Reed Kearns' mother was baptized into Christ this past week at the age of 80, 83, was baptized into Christ. And I think that took place because Reed and Jerry and Mike took occasion to speak to her about her need to accept Christ. And what a wonderful privilege that was. It says it can, it can be done. Though it is difficult, the love of Christ should compel every one of us to talk to those we love as soon as possible. I suspect if I were to give you a break right now and give each of you a sheet of paper and a pencil, you could write down a list of relatives or former schoolmates or somebody that you grew up with who doesn't know Jesus yet, and that maybe you have an inroad with that person that some, nobody else has. And so my challenge is, let's imitate Jesus in this unshakable confidence to go back to people with whom we grew up and share the love of Christ with them. Jesus had unshakable confidence, and therefore we ought to know him 
and imitate him. But there's something else we see in Luke chapter 4, and that is that Jesus had the confidence to announce his deity to those who were doubtful of it. Jesus had the unshakable confidence to announce who he was to those he knew would be skeptical of what he would say. Look, look at Luke 4, 17. It says, The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Now, I want to suggest to you that Jesus didn't just... You, do you ever, when you're getting ready to have your devotions, and maybe you just sort of say, Well, I don't know what to read today. Now, I, you know, that's not a good way to study your Bible, but I suspect some of us have done that at times. Jesus didn't that random just open, roll the Scripture open uh, in Isaiah. I think he purposely went to this particular passage that we're getting ready to read that predicted what the Messiah would do and be. Uh, in verse 18, here's what he reads from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, everybody in the synagogue knew that this passage was a prophecy about the coming Messiah. They'd heard it read many times. They'd heard rabbis talk about it and explain it. They had anticipated the fulfillment of this prophecy for a long time. And then in verse 20 it says, Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. You see, they stood up usually to read Scripture, but they sat down to teach. And then it says, The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, and Folks, this is a, not a light statement that he's going to say. He says, Today this Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture is fulfilled. He got their full attention, and he starts off by saying, Today, this scripture is fulfilled. Do you know what he was saying? Jesus was confidently announcing to his hometown folk, I am the Messiah. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. Now, expert handlers probably would have advised him differently. They probably would have said, Well, if you're going to make that announcement, Jesus, maybe you ought to make it somewhere else other than Nazareth. Maybe you ought to make it in Bethany, you know, where you've got Lazarus and Mary and Martha and a host of other good friends who have a lot of confidence in you and they'll uh, uh, give you their enthusiastic support and probably applaud the announcement. But Jesus went right into the synagogue of his hometown where he knew the message would not be well received and he declared himself to be the Messiah. Now that's unshakable confidence. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. And Jesus is basically saying, I know that you're skeptical. There's probably some of you sitting out there saying, well, we've heard that you've raised the dead, but why didn't you come home earlier and keep your father from dying? Uh, we've heard that you've healed crippled. Uh, there's a cripple out here on the edge of the uh, town. Why don't, you cripple, uh, why don't you heal him? Now, Matthew's gospel says that Jesus did no mighty work in Nazareth because of their unbelief. But Jesus says in verse 24, I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And there's a great truth here. Why is it? Stop and think. Why is it that the closer we are to something, the less we appreciate it? That was the case there with the people and, and Jesus there in his hometown. The closer they were to him, the less they appreciated him. But have you ever noticed that's true in our lives as well? You know, uh, in my travels, and I don't do a lot of travel, but I go to other parts of the country for meetings and all. I go out to Joplin, Missouri uh, a couple of times a year and, and different places with the North American. And uh, I can see eye, eyes light up when people say, well, where are you from? And I say, Virginia Beach, Virginia. <gasps> Virginia Beach. You know, and, and you can just sort of read their minds. They picture me, you know, out on the beach. You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Truth is, I never go down to the beach or I seldom go down to the beach. I mean, it's close. It's almost within walking distance. But I don't appreciate it like people out in the Midwest, you know, would appreciate living close to the beach. You're probably a lot like I am, you know. You, beach, oh, yeah. Oh, what's, so what, you know. 
Uh, and this sounds difficult to believe, but years ago, I read that a man lived his entire life close enough to Niagara Falls that he could hear the roar of the water going over the falls, but he never once made the effort to go see Niagara Falls. Can you imagine? People travel from all over the world to see the Niagara Falls, but because it was so close to him, he never fully appreciated it. Someone said that an expert is a regular guy away from home with a briefcase. You know, <laughs> Jesus said no prophet is honored in his hometown. But even though Nazareth wasn't very receptive, Jesus announced to them, I am the Messiah or I am deity. Now, we should have confidence in Jesus as the Son of God, even though there are, some, uh, there are a lot around us who are very skeptical of who he is. In fact, as you know, we live in a day and in a culture where more and more people are willing to put Jesus down on the level of other religious leaders. It's not unusual at all if you look at, turn TV talk shows on and uh, read publications and uh, hear people quoted. It's not unusual to hear more and more people saying, oh yeah, well, Jesus probably was a good religious leader in the manner of Buddha or Confucius or somebody else like that. But I want to read a series of statements that Jesus made about himself. You ask yourself as we look through some of these scriptures, what kind of person would make those statements if they were not true? In other words, notice as I read through some of these passages, most of them from the Gospel of John, what Jesus is claiming for himself. John 5, 24, he said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. If those words were not true, what kind of person would have uttered them? John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me and will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, 23 and 24, he says, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. What kind of person would make such a statement if it were not true? He said in John 8, 51, I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. John 8, 58, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered before Abraham was born, I am. Do you realize what he was saying when he said, I am? He was talking about his eternal preexistence, that he existed before uh, Abraham. John 10, 38, but if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, I am the, and I am the Father. John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, all of those statements, if they were not true, were made by a madman. Were made by a man who didn't have any sanity. In Matthew 26, when he was on trial for his life, Jesus remained silent most of the time, but the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said in Matthew 26, 24, or 64, yes, it is as you say. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. You see, Jesus claimed to be not of this world, to be God in the flesh. And that's what His flawless character reinforces. His miracles verify. His profound teaching assures. And His resurrection proves. He is not just another religious leader. His name is to be above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. C.S. Lewis has a classic quote. Perhaps you've read it. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept him as a good moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man who said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who said that he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. Simon Peter said in his first gospel sermon, Be assured of this, God has made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. We ought to know Jesus because of that great confidence that he had to claim who he was in spite of skeptics. And folks, you and I 
need to have that same kind of confidence as followers of Christ that no matter how many people say otherwise, we're willing to say Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. May we emulate Jesus in that kind of confidence. Let's look back at Luke chapter 4 again and see, thirdly, that Jesus had confidence to confront people with an unpopular truth. He had uh, confidence to confront people with an unpopular truth. You see, he confronted the people in Nazareth with their racist attitudes toward the Gentiles. And Jesus, you remember, had grown up there. He knew that the Jews hated the Gentiles and Gentiles hated the Jews. The animosity between them was unbelievable. Jesus had heard the innuendos. He'd seen the raised eyebrows. He'd heard the jokes made behind each other's back. So Jesus put down the scroll, and he confidently confronted this very sensitive issue. Now, if the people weren't paying real close attention, as but we see that they were, if they weren't, they, it would have gone right over their head. But look at verse 25. Jesus said, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel. Remember the phrase in Israel. That there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut down for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. And then Jesus said, Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, any of whom? Those widows in Israel. But to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. In other words, this was not an Israelite widow to whom Elijah went. What Jesus is saying here is, Elijah is one of your heroes in the scripture, but if you ever noticed when that terrible three and a half year famine came, Elijah was not helped by a Jewish widow, he was helped by a Gentile widow. He stayed at her home, he ate her food, he had conversation with her, he healed her son. He's saying, have you ever thought about that? No, they'd never thought about that, and they didn't like thinking about that either, as we'll see in a few moments. And then Jesus continues. He says, And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, who happened to be a, what? A Syrian or a Gentile. In other words, he said, Elisha is another one of your great heroes, great prophets that you love. And both Elijah and Elisha were great, outstanding men of God. But he says, but when Elisha healed a man of leprosy, even though there were a lot of Jewish lepers he could have healed, he healed a Gentile leper. Have you ever thought about that? And notice what Jesus was saying. Jesus was trying to get across to these hard-hearted and prejudice people that God loves Gentiles as much as he loves Jews and he loves Jews as much as he loves Gentiles. He doesn't play favorites. It was an unpopular truth that he was telling them. And we can see how unpopular it was by continuing to read in verse 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Can you imagine? They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. In other words, they're ready to kill Jesus. But Jesus had such a, a confidence. He was so fearless. He didn't hesitate to speak about controversial subjects and take an unpopular stand. And folks, again, there's a tremendous lesson for us today from Jesus. You see, God's people today in the pulpit and in the pew, need to have that same kind of confidence in our world. In every era, there are certain subjects that are very sensitive by nature, certain truths that are unpopular with the world. And the temptation for us is to avoid them so that we won't make people mad. My temptation as a preacher is to never preach about them because I don't want to get anybody's feathers ruffled. I don't want anybody to go out upset with me. Your temptation is in con conversation in the workplace or in the neighborhood to just sort of skirt around those issues or when the issue comes up to just sort of clam up and not say what you believe or what the Bible teaches about that particular subject. Now two of those subjects today are abortion and homosexuality. People see those as political issues you agree with me when I say I can't count the number of times that I've heard on some TV talk show or, or read in the newspaper that uh, Christians need to keep their noses out of those issues because they're political issues, they're not moral issues. You and I both know they're very much moral issues. 
Others will get uncomfortable when those subjects come up. Now, some might ask, Jimmy, it seems like you say a lot about those two issues in your preaching more than you say about other sins like greed or gluttony or whatever. Why is that? And it may be true, but let me explain it this way. Suppose we could get in a time machine and go back to November 1941. And we knew that within one week, the Japanese were going to attack. Now, let me ask you, if that be the case, where would you encourage the president and the military leaders of our, our, our nation to station the majority of our military might? In New York? Miami? Houston? Where? Where, where do you think we ought to put them? Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor would be a good place, good starting place, wouldn't it? In Hawaii, in, in Honolulu. Uh, wh- why? Because that's where the enemy is going to attack. And today, in this era in which we live, the adversary is attacking in the particular area of these two items that I've just mentioned, especially in the area of homosexuality, trying to legalize gay marriages, adoptive rights for gays, trying to force Boy Scouts to use gays as scout masters, trying to legitimize behavior that has for over 6,000 years been considered sinful. So I think the counterattack for the Christian needs to be focused in that area where Satan is attacking. Now, having said that, let me be real quick to add that while we need to be adamant in denouncing homosexual behavior, we need at the same time to love the people caught up in that behavior and with gracious speech and actions, let them know that we love them, that God loves them, and that we will befriend them and that we would love to see them come to know Christ and accept His salvation. If we love people, we're going to plead with them, come out of that lifestyle that is both dangerous to you physically and spiritually. But it is true that when one talks about some of those issues, there are those in the world who get furious and want to label you as a hate monger. But it is imperative, friends, that we be, like Jesus, recklessly confident in the truth of Scripture and be both courageous and loving in our response. Psalm 27, 3 says, Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. Jesus was confident to touch on a very sensitive subject, even though it made people angry. And then fourthly, in Luke, we see Jesus had confidence to continue to minister in spite of rejection. To continue to minister in spite of rejection. I love these next few verses. Remember where we stopped? They're leading him out to the edge of the the town, and there's this huge cliff, and they're getting ready to push Jesus over the cliff because they're so angry at him at what he had said about Elijah and Elisha and their treatment of Gentile people. But we read in verse 30, now he's right there at the edge of the cliff. They're ready to push him over, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. And so now this is the first attempt to kill the Lord, but his time has not yet come. So he just walked through the crowd. And the Bible doesn't say how that happened. And I've read some commentators that think it was it was a miracle that God just reached in and snatched him up out of that angry crowd and sat him down somewhere else. Now, I'm not saying God couldn't have done that. Certainly could have. I don't think, I don't picture it being that way. I think rather that it was just the sheer force of his character. It was who Jesus was. That he was a person of such confidence and integrity that when they got him to the edge of the cliff, he just looked around at the crowd and turned and said, Excuse me, please. Pardon me. Could I get by? Thank you. Good to see you. Goodbye now. We'll talk to you later. And walked right through the crowd. Can't you picture it? And everybody going. But we were going to push you over the cliff. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But just the sheer magnitude of his character and of his integrity is what I think caused him to just walk away. And he left and no one dared lay a hand on him. And immediately, here's what I want us to see. Immediately, he goes to another town, begins to teach and heal. He doesn't say, wow, that was a close call. I'm going to go preach in a Bible belt somewhere or take three months off. You know, I need a sabbatical after that close call. 
You know, we need that kind of confidence to continue, even though occasionally we're going to be rebuffed. Not everyone you invite to church is going to come. Some are going to brush you off. Not everyone who comes to visit here at Avalon is going to like it as much as you do and, and stay. They may come with you. You're excited. But then they say, well, that wasn't my cup of tea. And, and they don't come back. Not everyone you try to win to the Lord will respond. Some are going to turn away and reject him. That's the case. But when Paul went to Lystra, the people took him outside the city and stoned him. They thought he was dead. But listen, it says, but after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the good news in that city, won a large number of disciples. And then they returned to Lystra. That's where he'd been stoned. Paul had an unshakable confidence. He must have learned it from Jesus. He just kept preaching even though there were some who were going to reject it. And he got that idea from Jesus who walked through the crowd and went to the next village, started preaching again. The words of encouragement to us that Paul says in Galatians 6, 9, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Jesus had unshakable confidence. And even though they almost pushed him over the edge of a cliff, he continued to do and carry out the mission that God had given to him. Folks, God has given us a mission as well, to be salt and light, to be ambassadors for Christ. And there will be times, like in the ministry of Jesus, people will rebuff us. But let's not give up. Let's not become discouraged. Let us have that same unshakable confidence that if we get rejected here, that we'll just turn somewhere else. If this person says no, we'll go to somebody else because we have the, the promises of God found throughout His Word that His Word will not return void, that we sow the seed and God will bring the harvest. The truth, folks, is so powerful. When we share it in love, we don't know where that seed is going to grow. And when we follow the lead of Christ, His confidence motivates us to share His message with people, even with people who knew us when we were little children, uh, to proclaim His deity even to people who are skeptical, to stand for His truth even though we know it makes some people uncomfortable, and to confidently continue to sow the seed even though some may reject it. As the praise team comes to lead us in our closing chorus today, let me, with all of my might, Encourage everyone here today who is a Christian to say, I want to have that same unshakable confidence that Jesus had. And to pray, God, help me not to waver, but help me to be alert and to look for every opportunity to speak boldly on behalf of Christ, to speak the words of salvation to those who do not know Him yet. And if you're here today and not a Christian, then my encouragement to you is, don't you want to follow Somebody like I've described today. Somebody like I described last Sunday. Don't you want to know Him? To know Him is to have life eternal. And you can know Him today by accepting in obedience His Word, to confess your faith in Him, to repent of your sins, to be buried with Him in the waters of Christian baptism. And we stand ready to assist you in that. All you have to do is to come as we're standing and singing this closing song. Maybe you're already an immersed believer in Christ and desire to place your fellowship here with the local congregation. We welcome that decision. Or any decision that you have to make for Christ that you'd like to make publicly, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing together.